Salutations, Guthrie Govan here with part two of our string bending odyssey. Um, you may recall if you saw the previous instalment that we were dealing with all the little bends that lurk within the minor pentatonic scale, the blues scale if you will, and I thought we could explore a little further by applying some of the same principles to diatonic scales, like seven note scales. So just for fun, let's be in E major for a while. Huh? Hopefully most of you know some kind of major scale shape. If not, in the magazine you will find appropriate diagrams to guide your fingers in the right direction. Now, the main difference with these scales as opposed to the pentatonic stuff is that the bends are smaller, they hurt less. In some cases it might place a different kind of demand on your ear in terms of trying to sound as in tune as possible. Um, but it's all achievable, there will be no bleeding fingertips this month, I solemnly assure you. Um, so. Let's just look at a scale shape like this. That's the classic happy birthday scale. And now we're going to look for every melodic bend within that scale shape. So you would start with this note. Not the lowest note available to me, but it's the lowest root note. It makes me think of E when I hear that. So we're going to try and bend this up to the next note available in the major scale. Here it is. Now this one would go up to here. And as a quick aside, some of you might not enjoy bending with your little finger. Um, it's always a plan, whenever you can, to use more than one digit when you're bending a string, just so you can share the work, rather than overworking one finger for no reason. Uh, so you might not enjoy that. But I've seen that some people would advocate that you can remove this finger from the equation and use these two. And now, because this, this really long finger is at an angle, it feels more compatible with this pathetic short finger. And they can... So, if you like that approach, you'll see the ring finger actually isn't doing anything. It's just tagging along for the ride. Um, I sometimes find myself doing... Or... It's not important other than to make sure you've found a bending approach that feels good to you. Um, and then you just work your way up through the whole scale. And as with our pentatonic odyssey from before, your next assignment would be to test your muscle memory, to test your memory of how much each bend hurts when you're doing it correctly by pre-bending and then hitting the string and seeing if it sounds like music. That was suspicious, let's do that note again. And once you're happy with those, that's kind of all the melodic stuff you'll need to remember and then you can apply that for maybe the rest of the scale uh, all the notes that are available to you within this part of the neck yeah. um, you could even try and work on something where you stay on one string and then just try and climb up the whole neck uh, I find sometimes that can help encourage you to think more vocally um, And then your next step, maybe for the sake of being able to phrase in a more fluid fashion, you could bring in some slides as well. Huh? Um, while we're on the topic of slides, something you might want to explore is the idea of maybe having two adjacent notes like that, but not bending both of them. Um, so if you have a slide to connect this and this, um, there are two other alternatives other than this one that we've already done. Um, you could try this. 
that's kind of a different flavour in your phrasing. Uh, you bend up to a note and then release and slide up to the same note. Or you could maybe move backwards. Uh, so that's, that's a fun one to explore. Or you could create the illusion of a superhumanly wide bend by a... So what I'm doing there is kind of sliding halfway between the, the starting pitch and the ending pitch and then bending up. So really slowly, that's a... Uh, but if you kind of speed that up... That kind of idea. If you're familiar with Red House, you maybe know the kind of bluesy version of that. That kind of Hendrixy trick, where instead of just doing this bend, it's... Uh, that kind of vibe. It just adds a little something, it makes your note a little more interesting, um, gives it an extra quirk, if you like. Um, let's see. Um, on a related note, um, here's another thing you might want to try. This is kind of inspired by Jan Hammer, weirdly enough. Jan Hammer, the keyboard player, but unlike many keyboard players, Jan, it's, it seemed to me, always wanted to soak up some of the phrasing and inflections of electric guitar soloing. So he had this whole vocabulary of stuff that he would do with the pitch wheel on the keyboard. And you get the... Those kind of licks there. And then maybe you hear elements of that in some of Jeff Beck's phrasing, which I like to think kind of started out with the electric guitar and then went through Jan Hammer and then came back maybe in the way Jeff phrases. Um, so it's another way to kind of expand on the potential of what you can do with any bend that your hand is comfortable executing. And I guess the trick there, um, it's easier if you bend down, certainly on the, on the G string. The trick is to kind of hook your finger a little bit, so I guess it would look like that. Um, on a general note, a lot of the things that go wrong when people try to bend ambitiously um, happen not because of any lack of finger strength, they happen because the finger is at the wrong angle and you're not allowing it to function at its maximum potential. So if you're bending down like that and you, your finger is kind of flat along with the plane of the strings, the string wants to slip away from under your fingertip. So instead of trying that, if you arch your finger a little bit more, so it feels like you're kind of hooking it. Um, and then you can bend a lot faster and with more confidence, knowing that you're not going to get that, which is the bane of every string bender's life when they start out exploring this stuff. Um, just to round off that thought, if you're bending up towards the ceiling, um, you know, the opposite applies. Rather than hooking your finger like that, you want your the bones of your finger as much as possible to be underneath the string. And that kind of minimizes the chance that that will happen. Nobody likes to hear that. Uh, so again, I'll try and tilt my guitar in an inconvenient and awkward fashion. It kind of looks like that. So you can see that the average line of all the bones in my finger is pretty much parallel to the fret. It's underneath the string, pushing it up. So I like to think bending is about division of labor where the job of your fingertip is just to remain connected to the string and to kind of engulf the string slightly so it can't slip away. And then your fingertip has enough to worry about. And then a lot of the bending stuff, a lot of what you might perceive as the strength of your bend actually comes from your forearm and your wrist. So the, the job of your finger is just to be at the optimum angle to allow your forearm and your wrist to do what comes naturally to them. So um, there you go, some stuff to explore using bends within seven note scales. Um, needless to say, you could do the same stuff for any three note per string version of the major scale. Any, any of that stuff, you could apply it to a melodic minor mode. Basically anything that's already in your vocabulary. What I'm suggesting here is that you can expand that vocabulary by checking that you know every possible bend and then that you're able to do it backwards. 
Um, so I hope that helps, and I'll be back for more of this nonsense next month. Cheers.